Thank you, Paul. And hello, everyone. It's so good to be back speaking with Woodlands Green. This is one of my favorite organizations, and we've spent time together over the years talking about things like the Galveston Bay Report Card, which I'm really excited to say is being awarded a Gulf Guardian Award this year by the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. So a big shout out to Dr. Aaron Kinney and, and the team there at HARC. So proud of that work with Galveston Bay Foundation. And, um, you know, we've talked about issues such as climate and resilience, and we're going to get into that a, a little bit tonight. But um, as, as Paul mentioned, back in July of last year, I left HARC and moved on to the National Audubon Society. And it's really turning out um, to be a wonderful fit. It's a wonderful organization. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Audubon and um, some of the work that they've done over the years. But tonight I thought I'd introduce everyone to the, the organization and um, what we're doing in Texas and how we're thinking about birds and our communities. Um, you know, as, as Paul said, what's in, in what we've, you know, got here in the, the title of the presentation, what's, what's good for the birds is also really good for us and for the communities that we live in as well. And then we'll also talk about some of the programs that we've got going on at Audubon in our bird uh, friendly communities area. And um, some of those things may be of interest um, to, to folks in the woodlands. So really looking forward to your questions and, and a conversation afterwards. So I thought, let's see if I can get my slides to move. There we go. Uh, so I, I thought we'd start perhaps with um, just, you know, a quick overview of, of who we are at Audubon and, and what we're doing. Um, Audubon is an organization uh, that's more than 100 years old. Um, Audubon, Texas is the state office of the National Audubon Society. And um, in 2023, next year, at Audubon, Texas, we'll be celebrating the 100th anniversary of our coastal program. And it was really the coastal program that started Audubon's work um, in Texas. Audubon in Texas was actually started by two young women, two high schoolers um, in Galveston in the late 1800s, just before the 1900 storm. So um, it's, oh, it's really interesting to me that Audubon has its roots in Texas, in the Houston Galveston area, in Galveston in particular, and also being started um, by young women. And we've got some really uh, great programs oriented um, towards um, developing young women in conservation today. So just some really wonderful parallels stretching through the years at the organization. But at Audubon, our mission is pr to protect birds and the places that they need. And um, one of the, the ways that we do that is, yes, we, we focus on birds, priority species, priority habitats, but we work really hard to connect birds to issues that people care about and that affect our daily lives as well. And the work that we do throughout the Americas, and we're developing programs that actually stretch across the hemisphere from Canada down into to South America. Um, but we use tools relating to science, um, advocacy, advocacy, especially around policy, uh, education, and on the ground conservation. We've got, you can see here listed across the bottom of the slide, we've got five main program areas that our work focuses on. And even though, um, you know, coasts, climate, working lands, which is our grasslands conservation work, water, all of these things connect in different ways. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily put these programs in silos, um, but, but they, they really connect and, um, and, and we've got a lot of work that crosses across these program areas and into the Bird Friendly Communities program area, which we're going to be talking about quite a bit tonight. So a, a little bit about our network. This is one of the things about being in an organization that's over 100 years old and was actually started at the level of local Audubon chapters, that Audubon as an organization, it can, it's, a, it's a big network and it can be a confusing organization to really understand how it's organized. 
Um, but here at Audubon, Texas, again, the state office of the National Audubon Society, we have about 21 staff statewide, <laughs> but we have a really big network. And you can see on this map, names of local Audubon chapters across the state. We have um, more than 20 Audubon chapters across the state that are affiliated with the National Audubon Society. These Audubon chapters are actually individual, um, in many cases, standalone nonprofit organizations. So um, they're kind of a dotted line to, to us at Audubon Texas and uh, National Audubon. But um, we love to work with lo local Audubon chapters around the state uh, here in the greater Houston region. And I'm dialing in tonight from around the Lake Houston area. Uh, we've got the Houston Audubon Society, which is a really fantastic organization. If um, you've had the opportunity to work with them, they've got a number of sanctuaries around the greater Houston region that, that you can go and visit. But um, so we've got this network of, of local Audubon chapters. We've got three Audubon centers around the state. Those are the, um, the green dots that you see on the map. We have two in Dallas, the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center, the Trinity River Audubon Center. Um, we've got the Mitchell Lake Audubon Center on the south side of San Antonio. And there's my puppy saying hello. And uh, we've got the Sable Palm Sanctuary down in Brownsville, which is a really amazing place um, to visit. So I, I encourage you, if you like to travel around the state and get outdoors, to, to check out um, the, the Audubon centers and sanctuaries around the state as well. We also hold leases on 177 coastal islands along the Texas coast. And um, that's, as I mentioned, that's what started our coastal program back in 19, 1923. Um, Audubon, Texas um, took on leases for Green Island down in the lower Laguna Madre near, near um, Corpus Christi. And uh, one of the, the Ventoon Islands, um, or Vantoon Islands, as, as we say in, in Southeast Texas um, in, in Galveston Bay. So we've got a, a lot of um, great work going on around the state. Again, let me see if I can get my, there we go. Um, so coming from an organization like HARC, when I moved to Audubon, one of the reactions that I got from folks is birds, birds, why are you gonna go work on birds? Um, but really at Audubon, like I said, one of the things that we're working really hard to do is to connect what we're doing around bird conservation to all of those issues that we care about as, as people. And um, those issues that we think about when we talk about sustainability, which of course is a huge topic in a community like the Woodlands. So as, as we at Audubon Texas are thinking about our programs in the future, we're not just thinking about them through the lens of bird conservation. And those are those programs in climate, water, um, bird communities, working lands, et cetera. We're also thinking about them through these lenses of the people that we work with, the stakeholders, the landowners, the communities that we serve, the students and teachers that we work with, the environmental issues that we want to have an influence on around habitat conservation, water, carbon sequestration, natural infrastructure, and also thinking about how the work that we can do can help to um, positively, positively influence the economy of Texas in the future. So thinking about the built environment, um, engagement with the business community, public, private um, partnerships, that's that P3 acronym, public, private partnership opportunities, um, and market-based solutions. So these are all lenses and ways in which we're thinking about the, our programs um, and our projects moving forward. So why do we think about birds and people and bird-friendly communities? And why is that especially important in a state like Texas? Um, anyone who, all of us who live in Houston, anyone who's gone to Austin lately um, knows that we've got a lot of people coming into the state um, from other places uh, around the US. And once again, we are the fastest growing um, state in the nation. It, from 2020 through 2021, um, our population grew by 300,000 people. And um, 
it's known today that nearly three quarters of our population in the state actually lives in cities and in small communities. When you think about the area of land that encompasses, that's a small proportion of our state lands where we've got 75% of our population living. So we've, we've got a lot of population density um, in, in a, a relatively small area with, within the state. And as we think about how we want our communities to be more sustainable, to um, be green, how we you know, want to put practices in place to make sure that we've got clean air, uh, clean water and the like, um, this is where I think an organization like Audubon can work alongside um, many other organizations that are engaged in these issues uh, across communities. So why, why birds? So um, in, in the work that I, I did at HARC, as, as Paul mentioned around projects like the Galveston Bay Report Card, a lot of the work that we did over the years um, had to do with identifying indicators. So species um, that could be indicative of the quality of the environment and, um, and how the, the environment around us is, is changing over time. Birds are wonderful indicators as we think about things like water quality, um, habitat quantity, habitat quality. They also happen to be um, the most common visible wildlife on the planet. So you think about the animals that you see every day on the way to school, on the way to work. It's not fish. And I was trained as a fisheries biologist. I would love it to be fish, but it's not fish. It's very likely not mammals. What we see every day um, most typically are birds. Um, more and more Americans are saying that they enjoy activities such as bird watching. Um, bird watching, along with things like keeping house plants, ended up being some of the most um, quickly growing um, hobbies and activities in terms of popularity um, during these last few years uh, with the pandemic. And when we think about birds, they're, they're not just organisms that we see every day. We, I know when I, first thing when I wake up and if you live in a place like the woodlands and you're surrounded by beautiful trees like you are, probably one of the first things you hear in the morning are the birds. We also connect birds with places. The street that I live on is Red-Tailed Hawk Lane. We connect them to our family, to our friends, to memories. Um, there are just, birds are an integral part of our life, even if we don't think about ourselves as, as naturalists or as bird watchers per se. It's, um, they're just an organism that's, that's ubiquitous, ubiquitous with us in the communities in which we live. So, what do birds do for us? One of the things that um, I think maybe we've talked about in some of our past conversations, and, and you've probably um, heard this, this phrase and this topic mentioned in past discussions at your meetings with other presenters, are ecosystem services. Those, those services that ecosystems provide to us as humans, um, birds also, not, it's not just habitats that provide ecosystem services such as um, clean water, clean air, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. But birds also provide ecosystem services for us in, in terms of they, they pollinate our, our crops, they disperse seeds. When you think of what seeds um, grow to become, if you think of, of a bird um, moving um, a, a seed and, and that seed germinating and becoming a tree that ends up um, sequestering carbon, for us as, as people. Birds recycle nutrients through ecosystems. Um, you know, one of the species that we see a lot on the north side of town um, are, are, are birds such as black vultures and turkey vultures. They're not everyone's, I, I would say they're not most people's favorite bird, but they perform a vital ecosystem service for us and that they are scavengers and they have an important ecological role that also provides an ecological benefit to us as humans. Birds control pests, and they also stimulate tourism and economies. Um, increasingly, bird watching, and especially in Texas, people from all over the world come to Texas um, to, to enjoy bird watching, 
um, because of our location along the central flyway and also our position along the Gulf Coast, especially um, during migratory periods and along migratory routes. So um, it can actually drive a, a good amount of dollars moving through the, the state economy. In our network of Audubon centers um, across the country, we have 40 centers across the country and we have um, nearly a million visitors going through those centers every year. When we think about what birds need to survive, what birds need to survive isn't very different from what we need to survive as people. Um, birds need plentiful food resources, they need clean water, they need safe pathways, and they need shelter. Those are four of the key things. Um, and, and again, for us as people, those are all things that, that we need to, to survive and thrive in our communities as well. So, one of the, the other things that, that we and birds have in common is that we both face stressors. And these are some of the stressors that we've talked about um, to, together in the past. Um, this, this map is a map that was just published in, in the New York Times just a few weeks ago. You may have um, seen this circulating when it came out, but it shows um, ecosystems around the country that are considered um, to be at risk and in, in imperiled. Um, and in, in a state like Texas, this is particularly important, but even across the nation, private lands make up almost 70% of the areas that have important, con important concentrations of imperiled species. For us in, a state of, in the state of Texas, where we um, have 95, 96% of our lands held and owned privately, um, this influences how we think about conservation in the state and how we think about conservation um, in our communities. So again, when we think about biodiversity, um, ecological health, it has an impact um, for us as humans and also upon those um, bird populations that, that we at Audubon are interested in protecting. Drought. Um, that's another stressor. Um, water supply is something that we are going to be uh, dealing with as an issue in the coming decades in, in the state of Texas. Um, this, is, this is something that's not only going to affect our cities and our communities and, and us as people, but again, it's going to infect, affect habitats, ecosystems, and the wildlife that, that depend on them. Um, this is a, a map that I think we've probably um, reviewed together when we've, we've talked about climate and ecosystem resilience as people um, it, with, with changing climate, we're starting to experience what, we're, what are being recognized as um, you know, extreme weather events and, and disasters. Texas continues to lead the way in billion dollar disasters um, uh, across the country with $140 billion disasters um, dating back to 1980 is when NOAA started um, collecting these data. And so when we think about our communities and how we can become more resilient um, in the, the face of this, this changing future, um, again, some of the, the strategies that we can put in place for our communities are also strategies that, that can benefit the, the natural environment and, and fish, birds, and wildlife um, as well. Social vulnerability. This is a map of social vulnerability across the United States. Um, you can see the dark green. Those are the areas that are more socially vulnerable than, than others. These um, social, social vulnerability is, is influenced by factors such as um, poverty, um, you know, access to, to health resources, access to education, uh, whether someone is um, elderly and, you know, just has um, different aspects of, of their lives that make them more vulnerable to things like those um, extreme uh, weather events. But uh, again, it's a, another way to show us that this changing world around us, um, it's not only wildlife that are potentially imperiled, but it's also us as people um, that are, are, are more, more vulnerable. One of the reports that Audubon um, has published in the last few years and it's, there's a ton of information. There's a really wonderful tool, um, that interactive tool that you can use. And, and this is our, our survival by degrees report that was published 
in um, 2019. But what Audubon did, did is it took um, some of the data sets um, that, that we helped to populate with um, partners at, at Cornell University, um, along with the millions of citizen community scientists and birders that are around the country using tools like eBird. Um, they took those data and looked at them alongside some of the climate models um, that are um, being published through things like the National Climate Assessment um, by people like Dr. Catherine Hayhoe at Texas Tech University, who's um, a, a wonderful colleague of, of many folks working on climate issues in, in the greater Houston region. And um, Audubon looked at issues of climate through um, the, the lens of, of birds. And um, in this report, you'll see that we've identified habitats that, that could be at risk, um, birds that could be at risk, and you can actually drill down and um, look at, at resources uh, for, for birds in, in Texas. There's a lot going on on this graphic, and you certainly don't have to pick up on all of it. If you check out that report, you can really take a, a deeper dive into the information that's shared there. But one of the things that I wanted to call your attention to, and hopefully you can see my mouse moving around, is that these, these issues that we're looking at here on the left, sea level rise, urbanization, extreme heat in Houston, um, Hark, uh, Dr. Meredith Jennings, I think it was two summers ago, uh, worked with the city of Houston to do the first urban heat island um, large scale map. It was the largest urban heat island mapping effort in the country. Um, that was done in Houston a couple of summers ago and extreme heat is identified as an issue that we're going to, um, that we need to be thinking about um, in, in the future here in Houston. But if we look at extreme heat, um, droughts, all of these issues that we think about as people, if you look at this column right here where my cursor is, it also, these issues create vulnerabilities for species of birds. This is telling us that um, if we look at the three degree um, climate change, the three degree um, temperature increase scenario that alongside urbanization, we could see um, in this, if we're looking at our, our summer species that are in Texas during the summer, if we're looking at species um, that are in Texas during the winter, we could have between 150 to 250 species that are vulnerable um, to, to these changes that we see here along the left side. So as an organization, we're just trying to get more information out there to help people understand that again, things that we can do to help us as a society also um, help these, these species of birds that, that we care about as well. So let's start diving into some of the programs that we've got going on at Audubon. And, and I'm hoping this will maybe give you some ideas um, in terms of, of tools and, and resources and programs that might be of interest to you. Um, under our, our um, Bird Friendly Communities program, one of the, the big areas for us is plants for birds. And that's um, promoting the, um, the use of native plants across our landscapes, um, because one of the things that you may have seen in one of the slides um, shown earlier is that even the smallest landscapes that we can create in our backyards, at our schools, um, these can have great impacts for, for birds that are coming through our area, especially during migratory periods. And right now here at the end of March in spring, we're just getting ready to begin peak migration where we're going to see species um, moving back up towards their northern uh, breeding grounds where they'll um, be living throughout the summer until they start to move south again during fall migration. But we've got a, a really uh, neat tool at Audubon. I know if you're a native plant enthusiast, you're probably very familiar with um, things like the native plant database that's available through the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center at Audubon. Um, we also have a, a, a database um, that helps to identify native plants 
um, that are not only suitable for your area, but it also connects you and, and shows you um, what birds are attracted to those plants as well. So you can do your native um, plants and also uh, think about the birds that you want to attract to your yard as well. So if, if we're thinking uh, about resilience um, and how we can be more and have more resilient communities and, um, you know, for, for us, one of the ways that we can do that very easily um, within our, at our own homes, again, are, are through native plants. We don't necessarily have to think of resilience on these huge landscape scales where you have organizations that may be involved in uh, conservation projects, large scale conservation projects, large scale restoration projects. But there are things that we can do in our own homes um, to create uh, resilience for ourselves and also to create habitat for, uh, for birds. Native plants are a great way to do that. Um, they help us uh, adapt um, to local climate and, and soil conditions, planting plants that are, that are tolerant of those conditions. They provide resources and shelter for wildlife. They require fewer resources from us, of course, in the way of water, fertilizers, pesticides, so they help us reduce um, pollutants. And they also help us to, to mitigate things like, like climate change. Um, this is a, another way, and if we're thinking about things like birds and native plants, rather than just thinking about them through the lens of we care about them because we just care about things like birds and, and native plants and we understand their intrinsic value, there are other benefits um, that they can provide in terms of, of helping us to do things like conserve energy, in terms of helping us to improve um, soils, um, conserve water, uh, for us in Houston, we can use things like native plants to help um, manage storm water, um, you know, in, in terms of creating things like rain gardens, bioswales, um, all of those, those strategies that um, the wonderful Bob Daly is always talking to us about and always talking to uh, residents in, in the woodlands about. Um, these things not only help people, but they also um, provide benefits um, for, for, for birds as well. So this is um, the, the Plants for Birds database that, that I, I mentioned earlier. And um, it's, it's really great. You can create species lists um, you can, um, that you can print and use for later. And, and like I was mentioning here, it shows you the different types of birds that you can attract to your backyard, depending upon which native plants you choose. So it's, it just provides a, another um, facet to maybe what you're, you're getting through some of your other resources like the native plant database uh, through the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. If we think about our, if we think about issues of resilience on a much, larger scale, we have a real opportunity in greater Houston right now to change the way in which we um, engage on, on issues such as flood mitigation. Um, there's a, a growing movement in, in the greater Houston region that we don't just have to think about how fast we can move water away from homes and neighborhoods and down our bayous and towards Galveston Bay, but there are ways in which we can slow down the movement of water and actually um, hold that water in soils and um, release water more slowly to our creeks and our bayous. And this is through natural infrastructure. And it's um, basically, you know, creating uh, flood projects and flood strategies that either are, that consist of natural systems, that mimic natural systems, um, but in addition to providing um, flood mitigation benefits, they also provide other benefits and ecosystem services to our communities. And again, when we're putting these types of natural infrastructure in place, we're very often using things like native plants. And so as we're creating this nature-based infrastructure, we're also creating habitat 
um, which is really important in a place like Houston, the greater Houston region, um, and in Montgomery County, where we've got a lot of growth and in, in development occurring. So I want to, I just mentioned this because we can think about um, how we're approaching issues like resilience, how we're approaching issues um, like conservation, both at very small scales in terms of what we can do at our home, in our homes and in our backyards, as well as on um, larger scales in terms of these larger projects um, that we now have funding for um, in the greater Houston region in places like Montgomery County and places like, like Harris County. We've already got you know, great examples of these projects in place. The Woodlands continues to be one of the, the communities that's mentioned time and time again, in terms of a community that for a very long time um, has gotten it right when it comes to what nature-based infrastructure can do in terms of quality of life, in terms of flood mitigation, and in terms of providing habitat for people. Um, we've got you know, more and more, I, I hope, examples that are going to be coming online where we're not only creating these benefits for people and communities, but we're also creating valuable habitat um, for birds and wildlife. Exploration Green there at the bottom right, um, they've, I know, come in and presented um, at, at HARC and, and in the woodlands before. It's a fantastic project. Um, down in the Clear Lake region in Southeast Harris County that is um, a recent example of some really great work um, that's being done around the region. Um, this is a really interesting program and I hope that it may be, um, we can plant the seeds of some ideas, um, maybe uh, around Montgomery County and um, around the woodlands. This is a certification program that uh, we at Audubon Texas manage in partnership with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And um, it's a certification program where communities apply um, and they make commitments to protect birds and, and their habitats. Um, there's a, a series of, of criteria um, that are a part of this application process, but it's a really great program we now have eight cities. The program started in 2020. We now have eight cities and communities around the state that are certified as bird cities. Um, so the, the list is growing and um, it would be wonderful to, to see some communities in Montgomery County joining this list. Um, the, the vision for, for Bird City Texas is again through this lens of birds and wildlife, it's how do we put policies and strategies in place um, to create um, habitat and, to, and um, put wildlife management strategies in place for our more um, urban communities. Not everything that we do has to be out there in places um, that have you know, large expanses of um, natural, maybe more pristine habitat, but we have a ton of opportunities that we can put in place in our cities um, and com communities around the state. And, and through this program, there's also a really large um, education and outdoor uh, recreation component. And um, the, the criteria, there's a, a list of criteria that cities um, look to meet when they're applying for a Bird City Texas certification, but um, it, the criteria may mainly fall across three main areas. Number one, getting programs put in place around community engagement and community education, um, making commitments to enhance habitat in their community, and also making commitments um, to put programs and strategies in place um, that can help reduce uh, threats to birds. But it's a really exciting program and, and one that we and our partners at, at Texas Parks and Wildlife are, are really proud of. Um, a, another topic and um, something that, that connects to um, one of our, our program areas, and this is near and dear to my heart coming from HARC, is, is bird-friendly building design. At HARC, 
that you know you've all seen and, and probably visited the building a lot of thought went into um, green building design sustainability you know there are wonderful programs like lead certification programs for green buildings the lens through which we think about that at audubon is bird friendly building design where how can we not only have more sustainable and green buildings but how can we design our buildings to reduce um, impacts to birds, especially through collisions. Um, this is a, a, a photo and it's, um, I apologize for it being a, a bit of a morbid photo, but this is a photo of uh, uh, impact, a, a building impact survey that was done on one morning um, in the, the city of Dallas um, in 2021. These were the birds that were collected by um, Dallas Audubon volunteers during a migration period, um, birds that had been impacted by building collisions. So as we're trying to think about how we can design buildings to not only be green and sustainable, what solutions can we put in place that can affect things like the reflectivity of glass? Um, that's something that birds have a real problem in terms of the, their limited depth perception. You've probably seen this when you've had a bird run into your window at, at your windows at, at your home. They have a real issue with depth perception and so it's very difficult for them to see glass um, as, as a, a barrier uh, when they're flying. Um, we can think about things like lighting, being sure that we're dimming our lights and um, using lighting that's downcast so that we're not interfering with um, bird migration, native landscaping again, and also thinking about things like the appropriate siting of renewable energy systems. Um, again, being at HARC, we talk a lot about renewable energy, wind and solar, but if we're going to be building out this infrastructure in the state of Texas, there are things that we need to be thinking about so that we can um, appropriately site um, and locate those um, types of, that type of infrastructure so that we can minimize impacts to birds. This is just a, a list. I wish I had a list for Houston, but this is a list um, from Lights Out Dallas um, in terms of um, some of the species of birds that they collected um, during um, migration periods in 2020 and 2021 and species that were impacted um, through impacts with buildings during migration periods. So um, as you can see, it's, it's quite a, a diverse list of species and, and quite a long list of species. This is a great program um, that is managed across the state by our partners at Texan by Nature. That's an organization that was founded. It's a nonprofit. It was founded by Laura Bush, Mrs. Laura Bush, our former first lady. And um, we're really proud to say that in um, fall of this year for the fall migration, Audubon, Texas is gonna take, uh, take over the statewide coordination and facilitation of this program. But this is an engagement uh, awareness and education campaign that we and local Audubon chapters all across the state um, participate in during spring and fall migration to get um, cities, especially large buildings like you see here um, in this um, screenshot of the, the Houston night skyline, trying to get um, buildings, especially large buildings, to turn out their lights at night so that we don't create um, these impact um, barriers uh, for birds as they're moving along these migratory routes the map that you see there at the lower left, that's a map that was created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, this is their BirdCast website. If you haven't checked it out, I really recommend that you do. Once we get in, into um, the, the heart of, of spring migration, this is a really neat website and it um, they model and forecast uh, when birds are going to be um, moving through and um, uh, along for us along the central flyway. So it's a, a really great tool to get a sense for when migration is happening. And we can use tools like this um, to help guide uh, things like um, our building management efforts, especially when it comes to turning those lights out at night so that we can reduce um, those impacts and those, those, those building collisions for birds 
um, as we have millions of birds, as you can see in this graphic, there were more than 40 millions of million birds that were expected to um, be in flight on that one night in November of last year during fall migration. So tremendous numbers of birds moving through and they do typically um, migrate when it's migratory, um, the migratory period birds do typically uh, fly and move and migrate at night. So that's, that's why the focus on, on lights out. So to, to close, I wanted to just go back and um, you know, hit a couple of key points where when we're thinking about things that we can do for ourselves as people, that interest that we have in planting native plants for things like water conservation, invasive species prevention, that also provides benefits for our feathered friends, for birds, um, by the, through the provision of food resources, clean water, um, um, clean air, which is important for people, it's important for birds too, that creation of natural habitat, whether it's through those small scale things that we can do in our homes or through those large scale projects that we see um, happening more and more across the greater Houston region. Again, it provides benefits for us as people, um, benefits for birds, lights. We just talked about providing safe migration during those spring and fall migratory periods. For us as people, that equates to energy conservation. For those um, companies that operate those large buildings in places like downtown Houston, downtown uh, Dallas, even along the waterway in, in the woodlands, that means energy conservation and dollars saved when we're turning out those lights um, at night. And when we're thinking about things like building, de building design for us, it's not only thinking about green buildings and sustainability, but it's also thinking about how we can um, design our buildings to have less of an impact um, on, on, on birds and uh, wildlife species. So this is one of, of my favorite quotes when, when I'm, I'm thinking about these issues. And um, you know, we, we deal, we, we live in such a complex world and it seems like we have so many things coming at us on a daily basis when we think about these issues and we turn on the news and that sort of thing. But I, I love this quote because it just helps to simplify things. And if you take care of birds and if we do things um, for birds, we also help to take care of some of the, the big problems in the world and some of the big problems that we face. I just wanted to give a, a, a big shout out on uh, May 14th. Um, it's World Migratory Bird Day. When, if you're a social media person, when you're on social media on May 14th, hopefully you'll see information um, flying um, back and forth um, being posted about World Migratory Bird Day. It just so happens this year that uh, World Migratory Bird Day is focusing on light pollution as an issue. So um, that Lights Out Texas program, um, it's a, a really uh, great one uh, to highlight um, on, on this big day that's um, going to be coming up in, in mid-May. So just to, to be on the lookout for that. And um, so I, I hope that through, through this um, conversation, um, through, through this presentation, I've given you um, some ideas um, and you know, helped us to think a little bit more about you know, what we can do um, to make our communities um, better places for us to live, um, not only has benefits for us, but also um, can benefit the many, many species of, of birds that call uh, Greater Houston and Texas and, and the Woodlands home, and hopefully have given you some insight into some of the programs that we have going on at Audubon and, and Audubon, Texas as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. I said, I think so many of us, you know, we know that who, how, and Audubon started with uh, a long time ago with an artist that came down to make drawings of birds all over the U.S. But uh, and we know we have a, a really good bird book. But you brought all the other dimensions of Audubon to us, and I think that's 
that's what I hoped you would do is that there's so much more to it than, than just uh, books and birds. It's all about yes. the uh, habitats, et cetera. That's I was, right. you, would, you mentioned the habitats, you know, the, the place that always reminds me of how much of that habitat is gone already on the coast is like Boy Scout Woods and in, in uh, High Island where there's the, these mots or, or little clusters of oaks along the bay that used to be all over. That's right. And now, you know, now they're very isolated and, and it's the only place that these birds that some of which have flown all the way from South America, they mm -hmm. need a place to land and a place to eat. Well, they, they can't all eat there at Smith Point. And so I think uh, it also seems that the, the, the plants you mentioned, of course, are the same ones that the Woodlands Township and the Woodlands Green have talked about for butterflies. That's right. And other, yeah, I mean, they're, they're similar list, obviously. So we forget about how much they do as far as, uh, you that, know. That's, that's so true. And so much of what we do, especially around um, the, the Plants for Bird Pro, Plants for Birds program area and native plants. We work really closely um, with organizations that are focused on things like pollinators, on monarchs, um, you know, being sure that we're also providing habitat for those monarchs that are migrating through Texas, um, especially in the fall as they're making their way back down to, to Mexico. There are so many parallels. Um, you're, you're exactly right. And uh, the other thing that reminded me of the habitat loss is uh, I've been in the woodlands a long time and several decades ago I used to see not a lot of them but there were uh, red-headed woodpeckers were one of my favorite pretty birds and I, it's been a long long time since I've seen one out here so you realize that without your noticing it that they begin to disappear that we don't realize how specific some of the needs are and if true. we if we destroy their habitat then they're not going to be here they can't adapt that that quickly so the i wondered if you would talk about the just basically that 64 percent which is a scary number about um is there any one or two that are that we know of that are in trouble as far as in, today? In terms of, of, of birds that are, are in trouble, one of the, the, and this is getting down into our coastal program, but it's a, a really interesting species to, to think about. One of the birds that we're talking about a lot is a species called the American oyster catcher, which is a, a coastal bird that you'll see, hopefully, if you go down um, a to, to Galveston or, or, or points farther south. And it's not a listed species yet. So you won't see this listed as threatened or endangered by Texas Parks and Wildlife or any other agency. But we're starting to see declines in, in this species because as its name implies, it relies on habitats such as oyster reefs um, for, for, you know, for, for nesting and feeding. And um, oyster reefs are one of the habitats that we're seeing along the Texas coast that are really imperiled because of impacts um, from storms such as Hurricane Ike and Hurricane Harvey. Um, the other stressor that we're starting to see now, and it's just, it, it felt like this was so far off in the distance in, in the future at, at some point, but it's, it's happening now we're starting to see um, submergence of, of these habitats because of things like relative sea level rise and, and loss of these habitats. So it's not just those, those extreme events that we talked about at the beginning of the talk. Now it's kind of that, you know, that chronic change that we're starting to see that happens in very slow motion, um, but we're starting to, to see an, an effect on species like that. Yeah, and, and I was wondering, I think in Bob Daly and I've talked about the, the appearance of a lot of birds here that we haven't seen over the last decades, like the, and you don't have to go too far to the south to see Cara Cara that, that were usually in Mexico or South Texas. That's right. Um, 
All those That's right. We've got changing ranges, yeah, range expansions of, of species that were, you know, that are farther south. Um, to us, I, I think, you know, the, the other thing that um, researchers are, are thinking a lot about is, um, especially as we're thinking about a change in climate, how if, if we're seeing changes in, in terms of the timing of things like um, spring blooms, um, you know, that begins to cascade throughout ecosystems and you end up with a mismatch between the timing of, um, you know, some ecosystem processes and when, um, you know, bird species, for example, are moving through along migratory routes. And I think it's, you know, it's those types of changes that were just, that, that science is, is, you know, in the last decade or more has, you know, begun to document. And, you know, it's those types of things also that we're, we're thinking about on some of these larger, these larger scales. So, do you think it's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? I guess what occurs to me is the fact that these these migrant uh, the birds that are coming in that weren't here before, a lot of times we find out that they're competing with the birds that used to be here as that's where they were. Is that a problem when they start competing for? You know, for the, that's when when we're talking about things like these range expansions, Right, whether whether it's birds, whether it's species of fish, whether it's um, species of plants, we're seeing this all across our plant and animal kingdoms. Where, like here on the Texas coast, we're seeing mangroves begin to move farther and farther north. Um, in terms of fish, we're seeing gray snapper beginning to show up with more frequency in Galveston Bay when they were also a species that was down um, on the lower coast and towards Mexico. You mentioned Cara Cara and some of those southern bird species. I, I think for with, with, with what researchers are looking at now, what we can say is we're certainly going to see changes to like the base of, of food webs, whether they're aquatic or terrestrial food webs. I don't think we have enough evidence yet to be able to say if it's you know, to put a value on it, whether it's good or bad, but it is going to have a change and, and those changes are gonna have ripple effects that we can't even, I think, begin yet to understand that butterfly effect. We can't begin to understand what that, those impacts are going to be as they begin to cascade through ecosystems. But I think we can be certain that we've got some large scale shifts that are certainly coming our way. I don't see anything else in the chat, and you know I could ask you questions all night long, but <laughs> I, I, won't burden, <laughs> I won't burden <laughs> people with that. Uh, just I, would, I did want to mention that uh, those people who have maybe not been to one of these before, that you mentioned the award-winning uh, 